Hello, I'm Dr. Robin Cohen, Chair of the STS Workforce on Media Relations. And this is a panel discussion highlighting research presented at the 60th Annual Meeting of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons in San Antonio. The paper presented is entitled Predictors of Venous Thromboembolism After Lung Cancer Resection. It's a Massachusetts general study, but was headed by Dr. Andrea Axtell, who is now Assistant Professor of Surgery at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. We're also joined by experts Dr. Michael Smith from the Norton Thoracic Institute in Phoenix and Dr. John Mitchell, Professor and Chief of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at the University of Colorado. So, Andrea, venous thromboembolism and pulmonary emboli in the post-op period, sort of an age-old problem. And I sort of get the impression that it's less common and maybe even less dangerous. So what prompted your study and, and tell us what you learned? Well, I think for me, the most important research questions and certainly the ones that I'm most proud of, they always begin with a patient encounter. And I can remember a particular patient during my training that had a difficult complex pulmonary resection for lung cancer, but it went very smoothly. We were all very excited for her and her family. And unfortunately, a, a week later, she died as a result of a pulmonary embolism. And it, it sort of struck our team. It was somewhat unexpected. And so we went to the literature to try and see, are there risk factors we could have identified earlier, something we could have intervened on, or is there anything that we could have done differently so that future patients and, and generations of, of patients could benefit from that? And so what we did is we utilized the STS General Thoracic Surgery Database, which offers just a wonderful opportunity to capture a large, nationally representative sample of lung cancer patients. And we identified over 57,000 patients who underwent a first-time pulmonary res resection for lung cancer. We included all histologies and anything from a wedge to a pneumonectomy between the years of 2009 and 2021. Uh, and we looked at, in a multivariable model, what are risk predictors for VTE and specifically PE after lung cancer surgery. And we found some important predictors of those that included black race, the presence of underlying interstitial lung disease, and then more advanced stage lung cancer that required operations including bilobectomy or pneumonectomy. We then went on from there to look at a, a mortality analysis. So in those patients that did have a PE, what were risk factors that predicted that, or predicted mortality as a result of the PE? And we found that older age, poor pulmonary function, and again, having undergone a pneumonectomy were important risk factors. You know, we also looked at the operative approach and we found that minimally invasive approaches, particularly robotic surgery, had a, a benefit in terms of uh, preventing post-operative VTE compared to an open thoracotomy. So, you know, I think a lot of these risk factors that we identified are unfortunately non-modifiable. I do think that they are important risk factors that we should be aware of, because perhaps these are populations of patients where we can give more targeted prophylactic interventions to. So, a great study. So, John, it, it brings up the topic of the STS database. Most people know the cardiac surgery STS database, which I heard has almost 10 million patients. Tell us about the thoracic portion of the database and what's its utility for uh, promoting and improving research in your specialty? Well, thanks, Robin. All of the databases at the STS uh, are really jewels within the STS family. The general thoracic uh, database not only provides incredible opportunities for quality improvement, but also uh, to provide data and information for original research as was done in this study. And in fact, this study is almost ideal uh, uh, to query regarding the general thoracic database. I mean, a researcher comes up with an original idea, submits a, a proposal to the STS, gets the data back from the STS, and then the data can be analyzed either at the STS Research Center or at the, at the investigator's home institution, as was done in this case. And there's more to come. As noted in President McGilvery's address earlier today, uh, future enhancements will include the possibility of researchers conducting prospective trials using the database, and also the ability of the database to be linked to longitudinal data, so researchers can conduct long-term trials with long-term outcomes. Very important, very exciting. So 
are most thoracic surgeons reporting to the database? I assume all three of you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the penetrance of the general thoracic database is not what the cardiac uh, uh, involvement is, but it's rising. And I think it's going to continue to rise. Excellent. So, Andrea, you, you mentioned some very specific risk factors for VTE and, and PE, uh, some of them unmodifiable. Um, and then you talked about some strategies that I just want to ask you a little bit about. You, you, you talk about uh, enhanced awareness. Um, so, enhance, is enhanced awareness just recognizing risk factors, or have you developed strategies like do you routinely screen uh, in patients regardless of whether or not they're symptomatic? How do you, how do you manage patients who you feel are, are high risk from a, a diagnostic standpoint? Right, so I think that that begins really before surgery. So in your clinic when you're first meeting these patients, identifying potentially modifiable factors in terms of promoting uh, healthy weight, encouraging ambulation, stopping smoking before, before surgery. And then all of my patients were giving prophylactic heparin before the operation. They're maintained on mechanical prophylaxis during the operation and then the duration of their hospital stay in addition to pharmacologic prophylaxis. Uh, and then as a result of this work where we found such a high risk, especially in bilobectomy and pneumonectomy patients and some of these other risk factors I talked about, we've moved towards getting pre-discharge screening ultrasonography to look for occult DVT mm -hmm. that then could present later, especially as patients are having shorter length of stay, we may be pushing that into the outpatient setting. And while I can't comment specifically on the use of extended duration, meaning uh, pharmacologic prophylaxis in the outpatient setting, there have been other single institution studies, a great analysis out of Oxford that have actually decreased the risk of VTE and PE by extending the duration of pharmacologic prophylaxis for up to a month. So I think that that's a really exciting future avenue for our field to explore. Yeah, so you mentioned targeted anticoagulation and extended, which were terms that I really hadn't heard before. Are you, are you guys using that in your practices? No, we, we tend to uh, use a, uh, a standard protocol for uh, DVT prophylaxis. And so this is very enlightening to, to have the ability to highlight and um, identify patients that are higher risk that may benefit from a, either a more aggressive or more extended protocol. So. It's exciting work. So I love it when studies actually show statistical benefit from new technology. So when you made the statement that robotic surgery is protective, that was really interesting to me. Mike, John, I know you guys are robotic surgeons. Mike, tell me what has, tell me about robotic resections for lung cancer and what has the robotic approach added to your practice and what you're offering to patients? So the robotic approach is obviously a, another minimally invasive approach alongside with VATS. And so I think there are some advantages of robotic surgery over VATS, particularly with um, lymph node dissection. And uh, I think that in, in some circumstances, it has allowed open surgeons to move to a minimally invasive approach with robotics, as VATS is probably a little bit more challenging in some ways because of the, the uh, level of dexterity of the instrumentation. And so I think that it offers patients a minimally invasive approach that allows them to recover more quickly with, uh, in, in many ways, a, a greater lymph node dissection for more accurate surgical staging and faster recovery. Excellent. So, good science, better data keeping, new effective technology. I'd say lung cancer patients are in better, better hands. Yeah. Thanks so much, all of you. Thank you.